Welcome to The Bordeaux Show, an ongoing exploration of the famed region and its wines. I'm Ron Edwards, Master Sommelier and Director of Wine Education here at Winebo. Let me introduce your host, certified Bordeaux educator, TJ Griffin. TJ has held many jobs within the wine industry from hospitality to wholesale. Throughout his career, what he enjoyed most was learning about wine and sharing that knowledge with others. As corporate wine educator for Winebow, he now enjoys the privilege of doing what he loves full time. And now here to discuss today's topic, the families of Bordeaux, TJ Griffin. Good morning, TJ. Good morning, Ron. How are you? I am well. I am well. I can't complain. It's a little bit cool here in Richmond today, but it is March, so I guess that's normal. Judging by your background, I thought you were perhaps in Bordeaux. Well, you know, one can dream. Yes. One can dream. Although in mid-March in Bordeaux, it's probably pretty gray. You know, I'll take gray in Bordeaux over cool and gray in Richmond any day. Yeah. (laughs) Sounds like a better plan to me. All right. So let's get started because uh, we got some things to cover here. So just as a preamble, uh, the six families of Bordeaux wines is something that I learned through the Le Col. So it's a good way to... Uh, Le Col du Vin de Bordeaux, I should say. So it's a good way to break up Bordeaux by geography, by sort of appellation, and grouping things together. Um, their website is fantastic. You have a map. This is a still shot of their map, which is interactive. And if you click on the tabs, you'll see the different areas highlighted that it will cover. So this is, today we're going to talk about the so-called generic appellations. I know what that means uh, when they say generic appellations, but these wines, uh, it's a disservice to call them generic, but uh, these are the these are the region-wide appellations, Bordeaux and Bordeaux Superior. Um, yeah, so this, I, I think generic might be a little bit harsh in our, yeah. in our North American context of that, where it's, you know, generic Claritin <laughs> as opposed to... <laughs> Uh, this is not the CVS la- la- uh, label of uh, of Bordeaux. It's yes, we the, need to come the up with regional, the regional appellation. The regional, yeah, well, that's a better word instead of saying generic Bordeaux. It's nothing generic about it. Uh, well, at least you know for the vast majority. So this is this is the whole region. The wines can come from anywhere in the region, um, and sometimes they do. Um, more often than not, you know, some of these areas within here are you know devoted to. Um, very fine wines from from more uh, prestigious, I should say, appellations. So, you know, it's not not always that they're coming from, but they're permitted to, and that's the case with all of the appellations we'll talk about. So, these two AOCs, Bordeaux and Bordeaux Superior, uh, account for more than half of um, the vineyard area um, that goes into production. So, there's seven appellations depending on one website nine on another we'll talk about that in a second um but we have uh 55 of the bordelais vineyard four different colors seven appellations and one big geographical indication so there is a website um basically it's planet de bordeaux the bordeaux planet planet of bordeaux and that is a website specifically for the AOCs of Bordeaux and Bordeaux AOC, uh, Bordeaux Superior AOC. Um, so when we talked about it way back in episode two, we talked about 65 appellations and we're wondering where, where is that coming from? Uh, and we'll see in a second because even the Bordeaux, uh, so that they're on the Van de Bordeaux website, they list nine different app AOCs under this. Even the website devoted to this appellation only says seven. So that will tell you a little bit about uh, the confusion here. Apparently there's an argument to be had and they must be having it on a regular basis. Yes. Do the French argue? I don't, I'm not sure. They do, but it always sounds very polite because French is such a wonderful (laughs) language. It is a beautiful language. So this is what we think of when we think of um, everyday drinking Bordeaux. So this is the entire region. There's 35,500 uh, hectares of, of production. Um, this, according to them, they say it's 64%. The Vendor Bordeaux is 55. I don't know who to trust, so we'll go with, uh, we'll go with this. So it's a little more than uh, almost two thirds of the production now in Bordeaux. Mostly Merlot, which is Bordeaux. 
We've talked about that before. Merlot, Bordeaux is Merlot. Uh, these are wines for everyday drinking. These are wines that are generally unoaked, um, stainless steel or some older oak, but it's not to say they don't have some new oak. And this is uh, this picture is from the Planet de Bordeaux website. So reste simple, c'est tout un art. Roughly translated, simplicity is an art form. So I've talked about this many times over the years with, uh, you know, I remember quoting a, a famous Italian winemaker saying that his entry level wine was his biggest challenge. You know, when it's top wine, no expenses spared, of course it's going to be great and, and that he can do that. But to make the everyday wine great, uh, consistent is hard. That's the biggest challenge. And I think that's sort of what this is saying, uh, remaining simple. Staying simple uh, is an art form. Yeah, there's a kind of a restaurant analogy here too. Uh, a relatively well-known chef that I cut my teeth in the restaurant business with always told his uh, cook's line that the the salad was every bit as important as whatever fancy main course that the person on the other end of the of the cook's line was preparing because everything has to meet the same standard. Yeah, I remember one of the, it still sticks out in my memory, and it was probably 20 plus years ago at a little restaurant in the north end of Boston, Italian restaurant, an appetizer of uh, mission figs stuffed with uh, blue cheese, um, gorgonzola specifically, wrapped in prosciutto and drizzled with aged balsamic. It was one of the most delicious things I ever had, and it was just four ingredients simply prepared. So these wines... Uh, Ron, do you remember when you were starting out in wine, what the, what the perception of just Bordeaux AOC Rouge was? Um, having started out in the wine industry, primarily in the Midwest, um, we really didn't talk about these at this price point back then. You were really still addressing new world wines because that's what the consumer wanted. So I didn't really become aware of these until a little bit later when I started leaning on them to expand glass pour ranges and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I have I have great utilization for them now. So I've grown into these wines. And I think a lot of people my age are similar um, because there was a gap that was created in the marketplace and this wasn't filling them even though it could have. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I first started out, you know, it was, you didn't hear much about Bordeaux, Bordeaux AOC, you were talking about the classified growths and the left bank and, you know, Pomerol and Cinque Million. And that's, um, at that time, from what I remember, the, the quality was very variable. You could have a, you could have a really good bottle of wine at Bordeaux AOC, or you could have something that wasn't really that great. And uh, it's completely changed as the first growths and the, and the super seconds in those wines are going into the stratosphere and really not available for most people. The quality of this level has improved double, triple, quadruple, quintuple. There's some really, really good wine at this price point, uh, at this level. And everyday wine that we're seeing in the U.S. anywhere from what, like $12.99 to $17.99 in that range and amazing value and it's because, you know, these chateaux, as we were talking about before, they didn't have the resources that uh, other that the great houses had, but now they do. Maybe they don't have the same money, but they have access to the same methods. They have the same knowledge. They have the same you know know-how, and the quality is just through the roof. The other thing that's happened in this Appalachian is, like in a couple of the wines that we import, uh, really well-known, highly respected, classified growth winemakers or top class Centimillon winemakers had made enough money they could go out and have their own property. And so mm -hmm. these, these Bordeaux Rouge and Bordeaux Blanc properties are often the extension of somebody's great winemaking talent that is just, this is their home property. Um, and the rising tide has floated all ships, right? So as all of Bordeaux prices went up. That certainly allows you to have better uh, investment into your own property at the bottom tier. And, and I, that's a great assessment. I mean, why would I be thinking about Bordeaux Rouge in 1998 
making wine list when I could put Leo Villas Cost on the wine list for 170 bucks. No, I can't even buy it for 170 bucks. Much less put it on the wine list, right? So um, yeah, there was there's always a relative issue going on there. Sorry about that. So Bordeaux Superior Rouge, um, again, could be anywhere in the Appalachian, but uh, is a much smaller production. It's 17 and a half percent of the production. Now this, uh, you got to read the, the Appalachian laws carefully because some people will say this is a minimum of 12 months aging. Uh, it's actually a minimum of nine months aging, but it depends on the harvest date as so many European wines do. So it can be longer, but it must be a minimum of nine months aging. I don't. I did not see anything in the uh, Appalachian rules that said required oak. But that being said, it usually it does see some oak. It's a little more serious wine. They do have regulations about um, you know sugar levels um, and yields. So in theory, the superior is really saying this is a superior wine. This is a a, a step up from our Bordeaux AOC. Um, this is um, something to, to note about um, both of these wines, the Bordeaux, AOC, and Bordeaux. Actually, all, it affects all of, the, all of these wines in, to some degree or another, but mostly the reds here, is that um, supply is up and demand is a little bit down. So Bordeaux and uh, Bordeaux Superior wines, uh, they're being forced, some of the wineries are being forced to downgrade 10% of their wines to Vin de France just to, because the, the, the government's not letting them release it. So they're keeping the yields down, um, which is a shame. But if you if you can find Vin de France from this area, you might be pleasantly surprised. So those aren't, I should go back. Th these wines aren't too hard to find, Ron. You can see Bordeaux Superior pretty, pretty widely, right? Um, yeah, they, you see, uh, this is, I actually see Bordeaux Superior more often on a shelf than I see Bordeaux AOC when I'm just wandering through retail selections. Uh, they both exist, but that, that second half of the moniker makes people feel better about, about buying it, right? I mean, it, it has achieved its marketing goal. Yes, it has. And I should say the translation for here, uh, bien élevé à tout point de vue, um, a rough translation, but a good one, I think, is a fine wine from every perspective. That's what we're saying. Um, and uh, yes, I agree. I, I often see Bordeaux Superior at retail, and still, price wise, we're getting a real bargain here. Bordeaux Blanc, again, in theory, from anywhere in the region, but there's only about 5,800 5, hectares of vines that are uh, devoted to it. Uh, la fraîcheur a trouvé sa couleur. Freshness has found its color. That one I like. That's a that's a good one. Whoever came up with that probably deserves yeah, a that. Run. That one's pretty catchy. I have yeah. to admit. Um, so you can see in the in the uh, the sort of infographic art here, you have a fish and a pineapple. So I think they're saying notes of pineapple goes with fish and not the reverse. Because that wouldn't be appetizing. Or maybe they're just using the pineapple as the international sign of welcome and that you're welcome ah, to drink this wine. I did not think of that, but that's possible. Um, I, but the pineapple is a mysterious fruit. They, they used to rent them in 19th century England. So you could rent a pineapple to take to a party to show off your wealth. So they don't yeah, do that. But anymore. if you rented it, you couldn't give it away and, <laughs> and let them cut it open, could you? No, just to carry around and show off. Um, so when we think of, of white Bordeaux, we're usually talking about wines from the Alto de Mer. We're talking about, you know, the step up in Grave and Pesac Lyon, but there, there are plenty of Bordeaux Blanc wines out there. Um, almost 10% of the production, so that's significant. Uh, they're generally dry, uh, sec, uh, but sec can have a little residual sugar. So they can be bone dry, but often they have a couple of grams, up to three or five grams per liter in special circumstances, wine making circumstances. But there's also some moelleux, which means soft, but uh, you know denotes a wine with some sweetness. And as we'll talk about this and in the next slide, the sweetness is just a natural sweetness achieved by uh, a longer hang time, late ripening. 
I don't, I didn't see anything that prohibits bot botrytis, but there's no, certainly no requirement for it. So I, I think these are just a little bit late harvest, just a little bit of sweetness, uh, a little roundness, very refreshing. Freshness has found its color. So this is a, <laughs> a region, an appellation for, uh, for sweet wine. So a little bit different. Bordeaux Superior here isn't necessarily uh, talking as Superior Rouge that it's a better, a superior wine. It's just a different appellation. Bordeaux Superior Rouge is an AOC and almost a classification in and of itself. This is just an AOC. Um, in 2017, according to the Planet de Bordeaux, only 13 hectares of vines. So not a lot of production going on with this, but this is a, a minimum 17 grams per liter of residual sugar often quite a bit more, and again, um, achieved by late ripening grapes. So I've never seen one of these. Um, I, they exist, but uh, they're probably produced and consumed right in Bordeaux uh, locally, would be my guess. I've certainly never seen one. I think that this is very interesting, right? If you think about the, the marketing of the Superior Rouge, and how that has worked, right? And how they feel like, yeah, I'm going to buy a bottle of Bordeaux Red that isn't expensive, but it's superior. Mm -hmm. That's what, right? So this naming convention is fascinating to me. I, I assume they're playing off the idea that the truly great white wines of Bordeaux are Sauterne, Barsac, Ceron, right? And and uh, the and the neighbors. Um, and really, it's interesting if they're trying to make it a sweet wine appellation. 1.7% residual sugar is not really anywhere near sweet, right? right. That's Off like the ish. Yeah, that's that's like the really well liked California Chardonnay that nobody's telling you is you know 10 grams per liter residual sugar. <laughs> I think that's fascinating. Yeah, and. It's 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 weird. It's confusing marketing too, um, because there's nothing unless you know that there's nothing here that tells you it's sweet. Um, if you did see a bottle and you bought it, you're like, oh, I'm getting a better Bordeaux Blanc, and then you get home, you're like, oh, it's a little sweet. Um, the catchphrase here, le vin qui affiche sa douceur, is roughly translated to the wine or wine that shows off its sweetness. So it's it's proudly sweet. It's not uh, it's not ashamed of being sweet, Ron. It's, it's happy to be sweet. Neither am I. <laughs> so Bordeaux Rosé, uh, around 3,800 hecta 3, hectares of vines. This is a tiny bit of production. Uh, white grapes are allowed in this, which is interesting. Um, you know, the typical Bordeaux grapes, but white grapes, uh, the more major ones, Semillon, Semillon Blanc, up to 20%. And then, you know, the next level down, uh, Uni Blanc and those grapes that we talked about, up to 10%. So that's an interesting... Um, choice. You don't see that everywhere. I know you do see it in some places, but you don't see it everywhere. And this is a growing category, Ron, because rosé is a growing category. Everyone wants to make rosé now. Yep. Everybody's trying to catch up with Provence. They have, you know, a long history with it. And, and, and it is true. Every region that you go into now that makes red wine, somebody's making a rosé, you know, and uh, everybody's trying to capitalize on it. Uh, I've had some Bordeaux rosés that are quite delightful. Um, so I can, you know, it's, they're kind of following a trend already set of the Cabernet family rosé from, um, from the Loire Valley. Obviously those are a little fresher, a little cooler climate, but, um, Cabernet has been made into rosé in other places too, for that matter, in the South of France, it's put into rosé. So it, it, this is not an entirely new concept. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when the world turns its attention to pink, well, we'll offer one too. Yeah, and, and the appellation itself is new. They've been doing this for a while, but it's just coming to, it's new to us. Um, and I believe that probably for a lot of its history, it was a, it was a senye, it was bled off of, to make your red wines a little more concentrated. Um, and I believe that's probably the case for a lot of, of the Bordeaux Rosé right now, but there's also uh, rosé with intentions, as I've heard it called, um, you know, making it with some skin contact. And, and that's the focus of the wine, not to just make your red better. Yeah. Um, and definitely, if you're making rosé by intent, you're also viticulturally making rosé by intent, too, which is a different practice in the, in the vineyards as well. So 
Uh, it's and Sanye is not as needed as it once was in Bordeaux to concentrate grapes either because of better viticultural practices and, and warming climate, etc. So it does make sense that you'd have to kind of decide in advance if you really want to make good pink wine. Right. Um, so the catchphrase here, le vin gourmand des bonbons moments, uh, a good translation of that is the go-to wine for moments of sweetness. I like it. This is an interesting category. This is um, one of the most interesting things that I learned uh, when I was over there because I had never heard of this, Bordeaux Claret. This is uh, a tiny production, but more so than, than some of the other AOCs here. Um, red grapes only, and it has some, some good skin contact, enough uh, that it's a, a pale red wine, not quite a rosé, not quite a red wine, Pourquoi hésiter entre rouge et rosé? Why, why hesitate? Why choose? You don't have to choose between rose, rouge and red and rosé because we have the perfect wine for you. It's a little bit of both. Um, here you're getting uh, short skin contact, enough to pick up a, a lot more of the red fruits in the Bordeaux grapes and a lot more of that floral essence. So it's a light red. And this was, I wrote down here, the original Bordeaux with a question mark because back when Bordeaux began to be noticed uh, for wine, we're talking, you know, 13th, 14th century, uh, the most prized wines were the Vin du Nuit, the wine of one night um, that they called Claret, uh, because you, they were very clear, you could see through it. Uh, just a skin contact overnight, brief skin contact. And this was this is what sort of put Bordeaux, Bordeaux on the international scene. And uh, even the Brits, they would call it Claret, which is still a term uh, for, a lighter style of Bordeaux, right? We still hear that term, claret mentioned. Um, great luncheon, a luncheon claret, great wine for lunch. Uh, and then maybe you have a little more serious wine for your dinner, I guess. But this is a, a category that I've never seen in the US. It, I, we did see it once when we were over in um, you know, studying in Bordeaux, but a tiny, tiny production. Everyone in the class was so excited to hear about this and, this, and they were hoping that it would uh, expand in growth. I don't know if it has, um, but it's kind of a, it's a Bordeaux specialty that we don't see anywhere else. There's actually an appellation in Portugal that makes a similar thing. Hmm. Um, well, it's a slightly different idea, but it's the same approach, meaning making a red, white, a uh, what would this would be? This would be a rosé. <laughs> rosé. <laughs> uh, a a rosé. You've got you to patent that now because that's yeah. going to be what's put this um, yeah. It's uh, on the coast of, uh, like in the Lisboa area. And it's ah. uh, basically what they do is they, they take, a, they make some red wine and they make some white wine. And then while it's still fermenting, they blend them together to make a halfway between and it's uh, it's uh, it's actually similarly it's been in production for hundreds of years, and it was originally um, part of one mo one monastic group made it at, and it became famous as a style. And uh, I wonder if they were talking to each other as they were wandering about to the various <laughs> monasteries. I like rosé. That's going to catch on, Ron. Clément de Bordeaux. Um, we know that uh, arguably, although some would say inarguably, the best sparkling wine in the world comes from Champagne, which is a little bit to the north of Bordeaux. Um, but there's also some other really good sparkling wines uh, from other parts of France called the Cremont. We don't often hear about Cremont de Bordeaux. And from what I have heard, that was for, for some time for good reason. It wasn't, um, wasn't fantastic, I should say. But Again, the world's expanding. Bordeaux is popular, and uh, Cremant de Bordeaux is growing in popularity, and it's growing in quality. Still tiny, only 2% of production. Uh, comes in two styles. The, um, they don't, from what I gathered, I hope I'm not wrong, they don't mix the grapes. They have a white and they have a rosé. And the white is for white grapes, the rosé is for red grapes. Um, of course, it's uh, the traditional method as is required in uh, France. And like a Cremant, like most Cremant, it's a little softer. Uh, the mousse is a little bit softer than you would see in Champagne. Champagne is typically four to six atmospheres of pressure. 
Whereas Cremo de Bordeaux is about 3.5, which is more similar to Prosecco. So this is uh, uh, another pretty rare category. Um, il met la table en effervescence. It uh, makes your table sparkle, basically. So, um, well, who is... wouldn't want their table to sparkle? I mean, come on. Exactly. You can yeah. see there's like a cake and a birthday present and a lobster. <laughs> What, what going on there? Yeah, for all your occasions, dinner, yeah. special occasions, anytime you want your table to sparkle. Anytime that you want yep. your table to sparkle. And so. I think the rise of popularity of sparkling wine internationally, where it's it's not just a champagne-driven category anymore, has helped Cremont de Bordeaux, de Bordeaux uh, grow a bit and refine a bit. It, of the Cremont de, fill in the rest for France, I, I have found it over the years to be the clunkiest, right? Mm. So, um, but once <laughs> Cremant de Jura made it to the scene, the Bordelais were certainly not going to rest on, rest on that. So uh, they have improved, but the ones I've had in the last five years are far better than the ones I had 15 years ago. Yeah, and it's Bordeaux, I don't know if this was in their decision-making process, but uh, well, no, no, I'm sure it wasn't because this is, this is not new to them. This is new to us, but newer to us. But it strikes me as a region that wants to be, you don't have to go anywhere else. You can just stay with us. We'll give you dry whites. We'll give you reds. We'll give you sparkling wines, rosés, you know, every, sweet wines. We got it. We're a one-stop shop. And they, they, they really are. And as we were talked about, the, the quality has been variable in certain things. But across the board, the quality is uh, going up and up and up. So I guess they were staring at Italy going, wait a minute. If Italy can do it regionally, we can do it regionally because that's that's Italy's model, right? We have everything for you right here. <laughs> How would you go anywhere else? Uh, so this. Hey, hey, TJ. Yeah. Do you have a in your notes um, the grapes allowed in Cremont? I know that Cabernet is one of them for the rosé uh, coming up. I've got a question here from Andrea. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't want to miss state something but um i looked them up earlier it's it's the typical white grapes for white uh you know sauvignon blanc semillon sauvignon gris uh, no sauvignon blanc semillon muscadel mm -hmm. sauvignon gris and the others i don't know if some of the, the some of the less known whites are prohibited i didn't see that and then for reds it's the typical you know cabernet merlot cabernet franc tiberdo malbec carmenere um and so you typical Bordeaux grapes, but they don't, as I said, they don't mix them. So they don't allow, you know, like we would have um, in Champagne, you know, whites mixed with red grapes, as far as I could tell. That I could yeah. be wrong, but that's what I looked at. The one Bordeaux, uh, Cremant de Bordeaux, a rosé that I have played around with was actually Cabernet Franc rosé, uh, so 100%. Just that one was but th that doesn't express the law that just means that that one was so it sounds it, I, I remember the law being fairly generous but i didn't look it up for today so shame on me and yeah Cabernet Franc is is uh, proven itself as a as a good rosé grape so maybe that makes sense um good question thank you aubinoge is something that is again a little bit confusing for most because you hear it this uh, this AOC and the Van de Bordeaux considers this an AOC. I don't know if it's an AOC. It's 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 subregion maybe. Is it its own appellation? They say so, um, but it's very confusing because it's in the Entre de Mer, and you can produce two different wines uh, called Aubinoge. You can produce Entre de Mer Aubinoge, and you can produce Bordeaux Aubinoge. Um, in, when we're talking about Entre de Mer, as we'll get to uh, in a future episode, it's just for dry whites. Um, for Bordeaux, it's for dry and sweet whites. And the Aubenoge, this is the Chateau de Benoge, um, this denotes that it's from vineyards in specific communes, and the communes are listed, and there's no reason to go into them. They're towns that... Um, You'll probably never hear of R.B. Contois, Escoussin. Not really household names, but that's what this Aubinoge uh, designation is for. And again, uh, I've never seen one. 
I never yeah. I didn't see one when I was over there. I didn't. I don't see them on the shelves here. I don't know anyone asking for them, but it's it's a thing that was dates back hundreds and hundreds of years. They said we're very proud of our communes. So when the AOCs were formed, we want. They said we want to reserve our communes are great for these white wines, um, and they they gave them this uh, designation. Yeah, and it's really interesting. It's an old designation. It's like 1955. So yeah. this is this is nothing new. Um, no. And I also found it interesting that what's really coming out here, uh, as I was reading your research on it, is that it's basically a the reason it's from village to village, it's these villages that are sort of riding this ridge, the, this sort of uplift in the land that was the seabed. And so each of these little villages has a more calcareous, you know, seabed floor sort of source for its uh, vineyard land, which is a little unusual in Entre de Mer. Most of the stuff is lower and sandy and so forth. So it'd be interesting if they actually focused on it, right? It sounds like from the geology and the little bit of uplift that there actually could be a higher quality white wine coming off of here. Um, but I agree, I have, I've never seen a bottle. So yeah, <laughs> it, it looks really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to try, you know, comparison tasting um, if I could find a bottle, but first I have to find a bottle. So if I do, I'll let you know. Cool, that might even be worth coming to New Jersey to see you, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's always worth coming to New Jersey. So this is, I uh, just wanted to point out some of the uh, wines from, from our imports in, in Winebo um, that are in the Bordeaux and Bordeaux Superior AOCs in, in some form or fashion. So Ron, you're, you're the- Yeah, so Beau Rivage is um, a, a brand that is uh, handled by um, one of, one of the well-known uh, Bordelais uh, Negos slash uh, property ownerships, um, the same ownership that is uh, Focas Pori, our uh, producer, right? So um, this is one of many things that they do. And um, this is just a great example of sourcing good Bordeaux level fruit and uh, putting it out at a price that makes sense. So this is like, you know, $13.99 to $14.99 retail, um, which, it, you know, if we can get the tariffs removed, it would drop, you know, it'd be more like a $12.99 bottle, which is a pretty, pretty nice price for an everyday bottle of Bordeaux with, with uh, good quality uh, workmanship on top of it, right? Because these, these people know their business, right? Um, they have some uh, chateaus that are highly regarded in their property. So they have good winemaking oversight. So, and then uh, after Beau Rivage, you can go out and find um, this one, Chateau de Fontenil, uh, which also makes an entre de mer blanc, uh, because of course all entre de mer appellation is white. Um, but uh, they, the, you know, this wine is a uh, you know seventeen ninety nine, eighteen ninety nine retail, and um, a wine I buy for the house on a semi regular basis. I think the wine's absolutely delicious, um, very stylish, very. Uh, uh, food friendly because it doesn't see a lot of oak. I, I want to say the red is uh, all like concrete and stainless steel. Um, that's me searching in memory banks. So don't write it down as absolute fact, but uh, I, the rosé is, um, I haven't had the rosé, but uh, going on the qu wine quality that they make for their other items, I'm sure it's delicious. Uh, the Entrée de Mer Blanc, which we can talk about next time is fun because it, it actually, um, highlights all the all the interesting grapes of Bordeaux yeah. blending. And so we, let's make sure we cover that in our in our next series when we talk about that appellation. But there's actually a tasting note on Winebow YouTube on that wine if you want to look it up. Um, and the, the, the last of our direct exclusive imports is Chateau de Peranchere. And this wine is really interesting because this one's almost Bergerac. This is in the far east of the Bordeaux appellation. And um, really good talent. It's a fairly large property and it goes back, wow, 1570, I believe, is when this property was first created. Um, and these wines are delicious. They are made with a, a, a higher style and price point feel than um, what you would think when you're buying Bordeaux AOC. You will see oak on these wines and 
they also, the, the wines on the left of the screen are uh, coming in at that 1799 to 1899 range. And then the Cuvée Raphael named for the uh, gentleman that renovated the uh, Chateau in the 1950s, um, that one comes in around 26, 2499 to 2599. So all, all these wines in these price ranges we're talking about, when you think of, uh, you know, they're reflecting some of the tariffs, I believe, but think about the quality that you're getting at these price points and you look around the world and what are you mm-hmm. getting from other countries at that price, but what are you coming from our own country, from California mm-hmm. at 15, you know, 1299 to, you know, mid twenties, there's not, not a huge selection. And I can only imagine, because even without the tariffs, you're still talking about cost of taxes, cost of shipping, cost of warehousing, all that stuff. I can only imagine what these wines cost in Bordeaux. If you go down to the local store, you're a handful of Euro. Mm-hmm. You know, when you come back from Europe and you have all those coins in your pocket because you forgot to uh, to use them. And I do my best know. to use them all before I yeah. leave, but yeah. Oh, you're, you're better. Because trade, trading them back in is worthless. So. Yeah, you can't trade them. <laughs> uh, I always forget and I come home with a big, big pocket full of them. I usually try to save 10 or 15 total euros for when I get back so I can quickly get my espresso as soon as I get off the plane, but that's about it. <laughs> you sound like you're a professional traveler there. Well, I used to be. Now I'm, uh, I'm landlocked. Uh, I've, I've swallowed the anchor of COVID for the, for the short term. All right. Episode six coming up. Yeah, we're, we're cranking now. So we're going to go through the families one at a time. And I, I would highly recommend uh, checking out the website uh, on Vendée Bordeaux. Um, they have that great interactive map. But we're going to take you through it. If you don't have time to look for yourself, we'll take you through it ourselves. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing you. We're at the same time. We're now, everyone's changed their clocks, I hope, because mm. we're now in daylight savings time. So 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Tuesday, March 30th. All right. Thank you, TJ. Appreciate you doing that research and sharing with us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us.